All right, so last week we looked at kind of the closing of the end, and we saw Satan bound, we saw Satan put away for a period of a thousand years during the millennial kingdom, and we saw the millennial kingdom begin, that thousand year reign of Christ on the earth. And, um, you know, th these chapters, these last chapters are the best part of the book, and they're also some of the more confusing parts of the book because there's so many things flying around. And so we saw last week that with the start of the millennial kingdom, you've got a couple issues going on. You've got all the resurrected saints coming back, including Old Testament saints, the church, the tribulation, martyrs who've got resurrected bodies. They've come back to earth with Christ. We're all there. So you've got all these people with glorified bodies. And then you're also going to have human beings living on the earth because any, any of the people who come to faith in Christ during the seven years of the tribulation who are not martyred, in other words, aren't put to death by Antichrist, they will continue to live. And they'll go right into the millennial kingdom with human bodies, and they will have human babies, and those human babies will be born with sin natures. And so you're going to have this really strange mix of glorified individuals, including the church, sinless individuals living on earth with sinful people. And it's going to be Christ on the throne, Christ ruling in righteousness. And yet you're going to have people born because people are born with sin natures. Those human beings will bear children who will have a choice to make. Am I going to serve Jesus Christ or am, am I going to serve myself? Am I going to give in to my sin nature or am I going to accept Jesus Christ? So it's, it creates this really interesting combination. And you see this new generation multiple generations, because remember, it's a thousand years, and so a lot of people are going to be born during that thousand-year period of time. And that's how we get to the end, and you see Satan released, and he leads a rebellion. And the question has always been, where do these rebellious people come from? If everybody's redeemed, why in the world are they rebelling? Well, they're not all redeemed, because even though the millennium starts out with all those human beings being saved... They bear children, and those children will have a choice, and many of them will choose not to accept Christ, even though he's sitting on the throne, even though he's sovereign and ruling in righteousness. And so you're going to see this rebellion take place, and the rebellion will be dealt with by God. He will deal with it. We see this in chapter 20, verses 7 through 10. When the thousand years are ended, Satan gets released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations. And they marched up over the broad plain of the earth, surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city, Jerusalem. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur, or hell, where the beast and the false prophet were. The team gets back together. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. So this is how the millennium ends. All those who rebel with Satan, all those human beings who are who have chosen not to accept Christ during the thousand years, they will be destroyed and they will be sent to hell along with Satan who will join Antichrist and the false prophet. So this is how it ends. Well, that is going to now lead us into this next event, which we touched on, but we didn't finish it last week in verse 11 of chapter 20. And it's the great white throne judgment. It says... Then I saw, this is a transitional statement that, that John uses a lot. Whenever he's moving into something new, he's seeing a new vision, a new scene. He says, I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away and no place was found for them. And this is become, going to become important if we get to the next chapter. I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one of them according to what they had done. Now, this, this thing, just real briefly, it says, the sea gave up the dead. Um, why is that even emphasized? First of all, the dead referring, that's being referred to here are all those who rebelled against Christ sided with Satan and were destroyed. But it also includes all dead of all time who are outside of Christ. In other words, every person who's ever lived who's never accepted Jesus Christ is included in this description, the dead. And they're all going to be gathered together. 
Why the sea? Why is that important? Well, you have to remember in the first century context, to die at sea was a terrible thing because you didn't get a proper burial and your soul was separated from your body. And they did believe that there, there was an important time when bodies would be resurrected and put back together with the soul. Well, if your body's lost at sea and eaten by fish, then, then that's a horrible thing. And so what John is being told is don't worry about that. Everybody, no matter where they died, whether at sea or whether on earth, are going to be gathered together for this event, the great white throne judgment. So what's going on here? The great white throne judgment is a, one of two judgments that's going to take place. The first one is the Bema Seat judgment, which we're not going to get into detail about, but that's the one you and I will face. The Bema Seat judgment takes place at the rapture, and we will stand before God, before Christ and God, and we will be judged. But it's a different kind of judgment. It's not a judgment of your sins because your sins have already been paid for by Jesus Christ. It's the judgment of your works. What works? The works that you've done ever since coming to faith in Christ. Now, I've, I've probably shared this with you guys before, but the, the nightmare I had as a kid growing up was that this event, the Bema Seat Judgment, was going to be a nightmare because you were going to stand with millions or billions of people, all believers in Christ, stand before Jesus Christ and God the Father, and there's this massive screen, and on that screen will be projected everything you have ever done, evil, wicked, sinful, every thought, every, everything you've ever done is going to get projected, and you're all going to have to watch it, and you're going to be just like completely embarrassed by that process. Now, what bothered me was not that Jesus and God were going to see it, it was that my dad was going to see it, my mom were going to see it. <laughs> Because I had done a really good job hiding it for years. And that scared me. That's like, who, I don't want to go to that. I don't care if I'm going to heaven or not. I don't want to sit through that. Well, that's not how this works. It's not your sins being viewed, and they're not going to get viewed. There is no giant screen in heaven that I know of. But it's your, everything you've done in Christ since becoming a believer will be judged by Christ. It will be, it, we're told, set fire to and whatever is left over, whatever is of value, the wood, hay, and the stubble gets burned up, and then whatever is of precious metal, gold, silver, it will be lasting. And what you'll realize is that the only thing of value that you've done in your life is what's been done through you by Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. So all those good deeds that you did that you thought were so special that were done for selfish reasons and for a pat on the back and recognition, and that's going to get burned up. It's all the things you've done since becoming a believer. Not all your sins. Your sins are paid for. That's a different judgment. And it's really not a judgment in the sense of, am I going to get into heaven? If you're in Christ, you're going to heaven. You can rest in that. This is a different scene. This is a different situation. We've already seen it's for the dead. All the dead outside of Christ, all the dead who have ever lived, over the centuries, will be at this event, the Great White Throne Judgment. And it's one of the most significant events in the end times because it deals with sin, the sins of mankind once and for all. You know, you might say, well, gosh, he's already destroyed them, sent them to Hades. Well, but that's not the final judgment. That's, they've been sent to a holding place. They've suffered physical death and they've gone to Hades, but they've not yet, so they're not suffering eternal torment yet. So this is about the unredeemed, unsaved, those outside of Christ. And Daniel, thousands of years earlier, saw a vision of this. Here's what he says. As I looked, thrones were placed, multiple thrones, and ancient, the Ancient of Days took a seat. His clothing was white as snow and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames. Its wheels were burning fire. He has this incredible vision. He says, a stream of fire issued and came out from before him, from God, a thousand thousand served him. Now, this is, there's two groups mentioned here. A thousand thousand served him. That's a large number. And it's not a specific number. It's meant to say uh, there's going to be a lot of people serving God. That's the redeemed. That's the glorified. That's you and me, the church, the Old Testament saints. But then it says, and 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. That's a bigger number. It's a much bigger number. It's, don't take that number and say, well, oh, that's, that's all that's going to be there. No, it's representative of it's a much bigger number are going to be standing before him, and that's the dead. That's the unredeemed. We seem to, to learn from Scripture that there will be far more unredeemed than redeemed. 
far more unbelievers than believers when this takes place. And you can see that in the world around us right now. There are far more unbelievers than there are true believers. But what's going to happen is as the court sat in judgment and the books were open. Now keep in mind, this is thousands of years before John gets his vision and we see this designation by Daniel given to him by God of 10,000 times 10,000 standing before God in judgment and the books were open. So this is that second resurrection. You remember when we talked about the millennial, millennial kingdom, it's a thousand years long and there's two resurrections associated with it. The first one is the resurrection of the tribulation saints. They come back with us, the church, and with the Old Testament saints, and they will rule and reign for a thousand years. That's the first one. The second one is at the end. So you have the first one at the beginning of the millennium, the second one at the end. All the unbelievers of all time will be resurrected, and with their resurrection, they will get resurrection bodies. They will get glorified bodies. Why is that important? As we said last week, because they're going to have to last for eternity. They will go through eternal torment. And those bodies will have to be glorified, otherwise they wouldn't last for eternity. This body isn't going to last for eternity, I'm telling you. I'm not sure it's going to make it till tomorrow. <laughs> but it's not going to last for eternity. It's not built for eternity any more than this body is built for heaven and the eternal state. So this second resurrection is going to include Old Testament individuals. It's going to include those who lived during the church age but are outside of Christ, those who lived through the tribulation and rejected Christ and took the mark of the beast, and all those who are born during the millennial kingdom who choose not to accept Christ. All the unredeemed of all time, all the way back to Adam and Eve. That's who's going to be here. Standing before God for what? Judgment. This is the point. It's judgment time. You know, sometimes we, we live and we get frustrated because we see all these people doing wicked things and we wonder, God, when are you going to judge these people? Well, this is it. Be patient. It's going to happen. The purpose is judgment and their guilt is predetermined. When we hear uh, the idea of judgment, we think of court. We think of a trial. We think of defense attorneys and prose prosecuting attorneys and we think of a, a jury and and. This is not the scene here. This is not the typical trial we think of where, you know, here, none of these people are going to get a chance to defend themselves. They're not going to get a point, a point in time where they get to testify and go, you know, I, I really wasn't that bad. I shouldn't be here. I should be with that group. You know, Jim was a lot worse than I was. You know, he, he belongs here, but I don't belong. That ain't going to happen. And you're going to have nobody step up and defend you because you're defenseless. Your guilt is already predetermined and your fate is sealed. This is over. No la there are no second chances here. You're standing before God Almighty because you've rejected his son and you have chosen to reject the gift that he's offered you of salvation through faith alone in Christ alone. So there's no hope of acquittal. This is a pretty dismal scene, guys. This is billions of people. I don't know how many people have been born on this earth and how many people have rejected God over the centuries, but it's a lot of people. And they're all going to be standing there, and they have no hope of acquittal. Why? Because the Scriptures tell us the wages of sin is what? Death. Not just physical death, but eternal death. Eternal separation from God. Godly people find life. Proverbs tells us evil people eventually find death. Again, not just physical death, as bad as that may be to you, eternal death, eternal separation, eternal torment, eternal suffering is far worth, worse than just dying. There's something after death. Sin, when it's fully grown, James tells us, brings forth death. If you continue a life of sin, rejecting Jesus Christ as your Savior, you will experience eternal death. Death spread to all men because guess what? All have sinned. All those people, however many there are, standing before God and standing before the great white throne for their judgment will all be guilty because they've all sinned, just like you have sinned. But the only thing that makes you different is that you've accepted the free gift of Jesus Christ. You have had your sins paid for. You've had your sins forgiven. These people haven't. 
Well, we're told that there's some books that are open, and it's multiple books. It's not just one, and it's not really just two. It's, it's one book and a set of books, a compendium, a compendium of books are told about in this, this chapter. It says two books are mentioned, the book of life. This one is going to record every name of everyone in this room or who has ever lived, who's placed their faith in Christ, and you will be judged based on his work, not yours. See, that's what the Bema Seat judgment is all about. When you put that stuff out there, what's really getting judged is, is there anything of value here? And all of us will have something. My hope is I'm not standing next to like Mother Teresa. Because when the fire dies out, she's got like a pile and I've got like one little bobble. You know, it is going to happen. I mean, there, there are going to be degrees of good works versus burned up works. But the issue is you're there. These people are not going to be. So if your name's written in the book of life, guess what? You are judged based on the work of Christ, not your works. That ought to be a relief to you. But what about the book of death? It's not called that in this chapter, but that's really what it is. It's a set of books, and they are all about the record of names of those judged based on their own works. So God's going to have this grouping of books. I don't know how many there are, but if you think about it, if they're literal books, and there's no reason to think they're not, and names have been written down, and every name is associated with a whole list of deeds, that's a lot of books. You're going to need probably a couple of books yourself. So am I. And I think I'm going to be in this, these books. I think it's a, it's a list of every person who has ever lived and every sin they have ever committed by word, by deed, by thought are going to be listed there. I think we'll be in those books. The good part is we're in the other book too. And that's the real point here. There's two books. Two books are open or two sets of books, and they're going to be judged. It says, and the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. That's the key. All those unredeemed people from all the centuries are going to be judged by what's written in the books according to what they had done. And it says, they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Everything they've said, everything they've thought, everything they've done based on what's written in the books. And I think it's probably a pretty detailed accounting. Every white lie, every black lie, every mistruth, every evil thought, every committed sin, omitted sin, you know, it's all going to be there. And it's not going to be a pretty picture for all of those. And there's a couple of things we need to think about. You're going to be judged, or they're going to be judged on every act of commission, everything they have ever done, decided to do, chose to do, every sin they've committed, every word, every deed, every thought, and they're going to be recorded in these books. And again, I think even though we're in Christ, our names are in that book as well, and our deeds are there, but we don't have to worry about it because our names are in the other book. You're also going to be, or they're going to be judged based on every act of omission. And there's really only one act of omission that really counts, and it's not accepting Christ as Savior. So, yeah, you've done a whole lot of bad things, but you know what sends you to hell? It's not how many bad things you've done. It's the fact that you haven't accepted Christ. That's really, at the end of the day, yes, your sins do condemn you, the wages of sin are death, but it's the fact that you haven't accepted Christ that is really the issue here. That's why I think he has both sets of books, the book of life, the, book of, the books of death, because these people have re refused to accept Christ and therefore their names are not written in the book of life. So it's like God's going to look at this, this book, this set of books, and he's going to see this person's name, or he's going to say, let's say he sees Ken Miller's name and the list of all the sins I've committed, but then he's going to turn over here and he's going to look at this other book called the book of life and there's Ken's name. This doesn't matter. This doesn't matter. It's this that counts. My name is written in the book of life. See, Jesus told his disciples, don't rejoice because evil spirits obey you. They had just come, and come back from a trip where they had done some pretty incredible things, cast out demons, and they were bragging about it. And he says, don't, don't rejoice over that. Rejoice because your names are registered in heaven. 
See, you should, re- you should rejoice, guys, that your name is registered in heaven, and no matter what you do in this life, you can't screw that up. And some of us try really hard to screw that up. You can't. That doesn't mean go out and sin willy-nilly. Well, if, I, if it's taken care of, I can do whatever I want, and I always get automatic forgiveness. So Paul said, no, what are you, nuts? Don't do that. Live in righteousness. Live as who you are. God told Daniel, thousands of years before Jesus told his disciples, every one of your people, the Jews, whose names is written in the book will be rescued. See, there is this book, this book of life that's going to have a a registration of everyone who has believed in the promise of God, Jesus Christ, salvation through faith alone in Christ alone. Well, then he goes on and says, then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. That this this holding place called Hades is going to be eliminated because there's no purpose for it anymore because eventually everybody's going to go to hell. All those outside of Christ. This is the second death, the lake of fire. The second death is just simply, you're going to die. Everybody in this room is going to die at some point and sometime, someday, somehow, somewhere. You're going to die a physical death, but there is a second death that is far worse than that. And it's the judgment of God and being cast into hell, the lake of fire. Now listen to what it says. If anyone's name is not found written in the book of life, he's thrown into the lake of fire. If your name's not in the right book, this is your destiny. And my call to you would be is if, if you're not sure your name's right written in that book of life, you and God need to do some real serious conversation. You need to understand the gift and you need to accept the gift that's been offered to you through Jesus Christ. And that way, you know, your name is written in the book of life. See, these people standing before God are, are, everybody's names written in this, this big set of books, but their name's not written over here. And that's the real issue. Their names are not written in the book of life. And this is what I don't want you to miss. This is, to me, the most important part of this passage. What sends someone to hell? If you had someone come up to you today, just as you go to work, and, and, um, and I pray no one would ever say that, but let's say you meet an individual and he says, well, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a practicing homosexual and I, I'm proud of it and I don't think there's anything wrong with it and I think God approves of me and I think I'm going to heaven just like you and you said, you're going to hell. You'd be right and you'd be wrong because you're basically saying it's your actions that send you to hell. It's your works that send you to hell when it's really your, it's your your refusal of Jesus Christ that ultimately sends you to hell. See, everybody's going to hell. This is what we sometimes fail to recognize that everybody since Adam and Eve is going to hell. Why? Because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and the wages of sin is what? Death. Everybody's going to hell, no matter what they do. No matter how good they are, how bad they are, what sin they've committed, the degree of their sin, the gravity of their sin, it doesn't matter. We're all going to hell. The only thing that keeps us out of hell is what? Jesus Christ. That's the point. So it doesn't matter who you run into today, whether their, their sin is egregious or not. They're all sinners. And they all are going to the same destination, not based on how evil they are, but based on the fact that they have no righteousness. And the only place you get righteousness is through Jesus Christ. So what sends someone to hell? Is it the record of their sins? Is that the key? If that's the key, then there's no reason for God to get out the book of life. The book of life trumps this one. It's not your list of sins. It's the absence of your name in the book of life. And so when you see people today, here's what I want you to think. Not how evil they are, not how egregious their sins are, not because they wear their sins in their sleeve. It's, I wonder if their name is written in the book of life. And you ought to want to know. I've I've told you guys before, one of the things I admired about my dad when he was alive is that he couldn't walk into a room and not see two groups of people. You're either written in the Lamb's Book of Life or you're not. And my dad's obsession was, I got to find out which one you're in. And I got to make sure you get your name right, written in the right book and tell you how to do that. That ought to be an obsession for every one of us because every one of us has a list of recorded sins. 
The only thing that makes you different from the worst sinner that has ever lived is your name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life. It's not the degree of your sin. The Book of Life is the one that matters, and that's what this passage seems to be telling us. See, I love this from Romans 3.23. We're made right, justified with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And that's true of everyone who believes, no matter who we are, no matter what we've done. For everyone has sinned and we all fall short of God's glorious standard. See, it's faith in Christ that makes the difference. Then he goes on and he says, yet God with undeserved kindness declares that we are righteous. We are justified before him. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty for our sins, our sins. For God presented Jesus as a sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus Christ sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. That's what makes the difference. And so, again, as you go out about your day and as you run into people and do business with people and you think about family members and loved ones and where are their names written? We're all going to be in that one set of books. But is their name written in the Lamb's Book of Life? If not, that ought to be an obsession for every one of us. How can we make that happen? I can't save anybody. You can't save anybody. But I can sure lead them to Jesus. I can sure share the gospel with them. I can share my own testimony with them. I can tell them about this very thing, that there is a place. There is eternal life and there's eternal death. There is a there's something after this. Are you prepared for it? Are you ready for it? Well, this takes us to 21, and you may be thinking, we're never going to get through 21. Yeah, we are. Because we're not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about a big portion of chapter 21, because a big portion of 21 is describing heaven. And you may think, well, that's, that's the whole reason I sat through these last 21 weeks. <laughs> well, sorry. Go read it. Here's my take on, on um, the obsession with the description of heaven. It's interesting that in this chapter, it describes heaven, but it never explains any of it. It just describes it. It's guesstimated that it's going to be 15,000 or 1,500 miles wide and deep and tall. It's square. I, I can't explain that to you. I don't know how that works. I can't explain that the streets are gold and yet they're translucent. I can't explain that the gates are made of pearls. That's a big oyster. Okay, I can't explain any of this, and he doesn't explain it. So why do we spend so much time trying to figure out what every stone stands for and what every symbol stands for? Guess what? I think all it is is showing the glory and the majesty of God. It's the city of God coming to earth. So we're not going to spend time on that. But I do want to spend time on this. And it's something that I think a lot of us have missed over the years. I didn't know any of this when I was growing up in my dad's church because my dad never preached about it or taught about it. My view of heaven was so skewed, so warped, so insufficient, and I think it affected the way I looked at God and the way I looked at eternity. I had no real desire to go to heaven because it didn't sound that appealing to me. It just, you know, we were kind of joking a couple of us, we're going to, you know, maybe our clouds will pass you know, and we'll, we'll play harps together. And, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, that didn't appeal to me as a kid. It doesn't appeal to me now. Okay. But that's not heaven. Look at this. It says, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. We blow right past this when we read it. It's like, oh, okay. New heaven, new earth, old earth passed away. Great. Okay. Let's move on. And the sea was no more. All right. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So we, we see a new heaven and a new earth and a new Jerusalem. Once again, what is this? Why is this even happening and why is it important? Here's what you've got to remember. What we know from Scripture is this earth as we live on it and this universe is in a fallen state. It's suffering because of the fall. It's not the way God made it, and it's not the way he intended it. This earth is under a curse because of sin entering into the equation. You may have seen um, um, a recent report that they have, have a, Hubble, a new Hubble photograph of two galaxies colliding. You know, this, this whole universe is in what? Entropy? Isn't that what it is? It's all in kind of a... It's, it's spinning into decay. It's all falling apart. It's all destroying itself. Our sun's going to eventually destroy itself. 
it's not because something's going to happen first. But it is eventually, if given enough time, it will run out of steam, run out of fuel. It will, it will fail to exist. This earth is suffering. It's suffering in a major way, and we know it from Romans 8.20. Against its will, all creation, all creation, everything we see was subjected to God's curse. But with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. This world is suffering death and decay. It's all around us. For we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Groaning, why? Because it's longing for its recreation, its renewal. We also know that the heavens and earth have suffered tremendously during the seven years of the tribulation we've been studying. 100-pound hailstones falling from the sky. It seems to teach that it's, it's worldwide. That's a lot of damage. That, that's going to be destruction. We've seen he, uh, islands disappear and mountains disappear, and we've seen s complete seas turn to blood. The, the earth is going to be, at the end of the seven years, is going to be in a really sorry state. It's going to be in bad shape. Why? Because of sin. Because God has brought judgment on the earth and upon men living on the earth. So fall, but also the tribulation. So what's God going to do? Well, he's promised to recreate it, not renovate it. And this is so important to me because we're all about renovation, right? You know, we, we want to renovate our bodies and we want to renovate our homes. Some of the most popular TV shows are about home renovations, which I, I just, I can't understand that. You know, all I see is money, money I don't have, you know, talent I don't have. I just get jealous. It doesn't, it doesn't encourage me. It just frustrates me. Well, see, we're all about renovation. Put a Band-Aid on it. Make it slightly better. And, it, and that's the way we approach our Christian lives. Well, I'm, I'm a little better than I used to be. See, that's not what God's about. God's not about a slightly better version of your old you. That's not the point here. It's about recreation, not renovation. See, Paul told the Corinthians, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. I know what you're thinking. Ken, when I get up in the morning and look in the mirror, I don't look like a new creation. It looks like an older version of the younger me. It is. But in God's eyes, you are a new creation because you have the Holy Spirit living within you and you are in the process of being sanctified and one day you will be glorified, which means you will be made perfect. See, God sees the big picture. You just see the immediate picture. I look in the mirror and I see Ken the way he looks right now and I'm not real happy with that sometimes. But see, God knows the end. I am a new creation. You are a new creation. God told Isaiah, behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. He's going to do something new. He's going to create a new heaven and a new earth. Again, Isaiah 43, remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I'm doing a new thing. What we're seeing in chapter 21 is God doing a new thing. God has brought judgment on the world. God has brought judgment on the earth. Remember, we've seen things falling out of the sky. We've seen all kinds of meteorolo meteorological and cosmological things happening during the seven years. And now God's going to make it all new. He has to. Why? Because it's been marred by sin. Sin has to be wiped out. You can't whitewash over it. It has to be wiped out. God is in the process of wiping sin from your life. And sometimes we fight them in that process because we just want to whitewash over it. What did, what did Jesus say to the, the Pharisees? You're like whitewashed tombs. You look pretty on the outside, but you're full of sin and decay on the inside. You can't whitewash over sin. It has to be eradicated. It has to be removed. So God, because this world has fallen, this universe has fallen, is going to make all things new. He's required to do it because he's a holy God. He's got to do it. The old has to be done away with. So what we see here in chapter 21 is the old being removed and being replaced with something new. And that includes creation. Which makes me think of this statement that Jesus made to the, to the disciples. No one puts new wine into old wineskins. For the wine would burst the wineskins and the wine and the skins would both be lost. New wine calls for new wineskins. This earth is not inhabitable for glorified people. Even though we'll live here for a thousand years, this earth is not what God intended for these glorified bodies that we're going to receive. It's got to all be made new. So Peter tells us the day of the Lord will come like a thief. 
this day that we're talking about in which the, new, the heavens will pass away with a roar, the elements will be dissolved, burning with heat, and the earth and the works in it will not be found. God's going to get rid of it. See, he's going he's to glorify us, but he's also going to glorify his creation. He's going to return it to the, its original glory, the way it was in the beginning before sin entered the scene. See, the frustrating thing, though, is it doesn't tell me how he's going to do it. And there's something in every one of us, okay, well, how does this happen? Because it sounds too impossible. It sounds too incredible. But he doesn't tell me how he's going to do it. We're not told when he's going to do it, except that it's going to be after the thousand-year reign of Christ. And we're not told how long it's going to take, but it seems to be it's going to be instantaneous. That it's going to happen quickly, that God's going to remove and he's going to replace. He's going to get rid of and he's going to bring in the new. The new is going to come. It's going to happen quickly. It's not going to happen over billions of years. This is one of the reasons I believe in a seven-day creation story. Well, Jesus believed it and I believe it. And I don't think it's this combination of God creating and its evolution and it took billions of years. I, I, you may think I'm an idiot and that's okay. Many people do. But I believe that this, it's a miracle. God created the earth, the Bible tells me, in six days and rested on the seventh. And I think he can replace it all in an instant. God can do what God wants to do. God is sovereign. God is all powerful. And so what we see is he's going to bring a new heavens. He's going to bring a new earth. And he's going to bring this thing called a new Jerusalem, which I never even heard about growing up as a kid. What's the new Jerusalem? We'll see in just a second. But it's all new. Nothing from the old, it's all new. And think about it. We're going to be there, and we're all new. We got new bodies. We got new natures. We have no sin nature. We're not like we, what we used to be. We're not a slightly improved version. We're an all-new version of the old us. And so it's all going to be new, including this thing called the New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, provide, prepared as a bride adorned for a husband. And it says, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. Now, again, what we do is we read chapter 21 and we start focusing in on the streets of gold and the pearl gates and the, all this imagery of wealth and opulence because we're attracted to that. This is not about your crib in heaven. This is, this is not the point of this. This is the point. New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. And it's the dwelling place of God with man. This is the point. Don't miss this point. Don't get hung up on all the other stuff. It says, he will dwell with them. Who? Us. And they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. Over and over he says, with, with, with. God's going to be with us. Is God with us right now? Yes, in a spiritual form, in a spirit form, God is with us. He's with us through the indwelling spirit. But this is different. This is God living with you. It's just like Adam and Eve in the garden when they walked with God and they talked with God and they had fellowship with God and then sin screwed it up. What this tells me is with sin out of the way, with the earth made new, God's going to come and he's going he's to live with us. That's pretty significant. And that's why he goes on and says, and he'll wipe away every tear from their eyes and there'll be no more death and there'll be no more pain and no more sorrow, no more mourning. Why? Because there's no sin, there's no evil, there's no wickedness, and we get to be with God. There's nothing that will separate us from God. He himself will be with us as our God. See, we get hung up on the place, heaven, the streets of gold, the pearl gates, and we forget what's the purpose of all of this happening, that God is bringing to earth, to his creation, a new Jerusalem, and basically you can say heaven. He's bringing heaven to earth, and he will live with us. We will live with him. So don't miss the forest for the trees. Don't get hung up on the stuff that, that sounds so fun and so descriptive and so wild and so incredible. It is, but the incredible thing is God will be with us, Emmanuel. What was one of Jesus' names? Emmanuel, God with us. See, he was God come in the flesh, God living amongst us. But this is God himself coming, no longer as a burning bush like he appeared to Moses, not a pillar of fire or a pillar of cloud. It's not going to be a representation of God. It's going to be God. No more smoke, fire, thunder, lightning on the top of Mount Sinai. It's God living and walking with us. What's he look like? I don't have a clue because the Bible doesn't tell me. 
He hadn't changed. He's not taking on human form, but we're going to be able to look at him and we won't have to be hidden in the cleft of the rock like Moses was when he said, show me yourself. Let me see you. And he says, well, I'll let you see my back, but if you see the front, you'll die. That's not going to be the case here. He won't even come as the incarnate son. Jesus will be there. We'll be with him. We'll be with the Holy Spirit, but we're going to be with God. No more intermediary, no more representation, God himself living with us. And again, what's the result? No more tears, no more sorrow, no more crying, no more pain, because all that stuff has been replaced. It's gone. No more threat. And, and one of the amazing things about this, guys, is to think, I had a guy ask me the other day, he goes, well, Ken, if, if this is true and this happens, well, if Adam and Eve fell, why, why can't we fall again? What's the difference? Adam and Eve were human. Adam and Eve, no, they weren't made with sin natures, but they were made with a choice. They could make a choice, and God knew from before the foundation of the world that they would make a choice because he had already planned on sending his son to pay for their choice. But see, we'll be glorified. We will be without sin. We will have no capacity for sin. There will be no Satan. There will be no Antichrist. There will be no evil. This is totally new. This is totally fixed where we can't turn. We will not rebel. Well, he says, behold, I'm making all things new. Write this down for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. See, John's job has been all along to write stuff down. And now he says, he's told one more time, write this down. What, write what down? Everything he's just heard. The great white throne judgment, this new heavens and a new earth. And he says, write it down. When? First century. See, he's living in the first century on the island of Patmos. He's writing it to first century churches, and by extension, it's come to us. But he says, write it down. Write it down right now. It is done, but it's not done. In other words, when he writes it down, he's living in the first century. We're in the 21st century, and it's still not done. Has it happened? No. But what is God saying? Write it down because it's going to happen. Why is it going to happen? Because God has said it, and it's inevitable, and it's unstoppable. It can't be stopped. And he says, these words are trustworthy. That word is pistos. It's believable. It's reliable. You can count on it. It's faithful. He says, they're true. They're sincere. They are reliable. You can put your money on it. Write it down in the first century, and here we are in the 21st century, and we can still rely on it. Why? Because God said it. It's a promise of God. That's why we read this book. That's why we study this book. That's why we should listen to what this book has to say, because it's a promise of God, of things to come. And then he talks about, to the, to the thirsty, I will give from the springs of the water of life without payment. He describes himself as the alpha, the omega, the beginning and the end. He's the start. He's the finish. He's all in all. He's all things. That's why he can speak about these things, because he's God and he knows he knows how it's going to end. He's got a plan. He's working the plan, and he's working it perfectly and on his timing. But what's this water of life thing? And we'll talk more about this in detail next week. But listen to what John says. Jesus is talking to the woman at the well. He says, everyone who drinks of this water, water from the well, will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will come, become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. He's offering her eternal life. He's offering her the eternal state. How do you get there? By having your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life, by placing your faith in Jesus Christ. It's not going to mean that she's never going to sin again, but it means that her name will be where it needs to be so that she can spend eternity with God the Father and God the Son. Isaiah says, God, come, everyone who's thirsts, come to the waters. What waters? These waters of eternal life that are available. Revelation 22.1 will tell us that the angel showed me the river, the water of life, brightest crystal flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb. There's this picture in chapter 22 as we end next week that is all about the water, the flow of eternal life that will never end. It will never stop. We never have to fear death. Why? Because we're with God the Son and God the Father, and we didn't have to pay for it. It's a free gift. So this whole idea that we're going to be with him Nobody who is evil, no sorcerer, no idolater, all the liars, their portion will be in the lake of fire. There's this juxtaposition between the redeemed and the unredeemed, those going to heaven, those going to hell. But guess where I'm going to be? I'm going to be with the ones in eternity, sitting before God the Son and God the Father. 
And then we'll wrap it up with this. He says, then came one of the seven angels with, who had the seven bowls full of the seven plagues. These guys have multiple jobs. They multitask. So they were pouring out judgments. Now they come and they say, come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain. And he showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, its radiance like a most rare jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. And then he goes on to the incredible description that we all know about. This is the new Jerusalem, the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven. It's been made by God, prepared for by God, sent to earth. But he refers to it as the bride of Christ. Why? I thought we were the bride of Christ. I thought the church was the bride of Christ. We are. But we'll be residing in that city along with the Old Testament saints and the tribulation saints. And every person who's ever accepted Jesus Christ, we will be residents and we will become all the redeemed, all living together. And we all become at that point in time, the bride of Christ. We're all unified. See, I don't think in heaven you're going to have languages. I don't think you're going to have tribes. I don't think you're going to have cultural differences. What are the biggest problem in our world today? Cultural differences. Color your skin, color my skin. Your language versus my language. See, I don't think you're going to have that. The whole reason languages exist, we're told in Genesis, is because of the sin of man, Babel. God brought language, confused their language. I think it's all going to be joined together and we're all going to be one, every tribe, nation, and tongue, but we won't, we won't live as every tribe, nation, and tongue. We'll live as the bride of Christ. And this is the eternal state. And what's cool about it is that there's no temple, There's no sun, there's no moon, they've all been done away with, there's no need for it, the gates never get shut, there's nothing detestable, there's nothing false, only those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. So there's no temple because guess what? God and the Son are present. The only reason you go to church is it's your place to worship God, but guess what? You're going to worship God right in front of Him. There's no sun or moon because they provide the light. Don't know how that works, guys. I can't explain it to you. We'll see it when we get there. And there's no need to shut the gates because there's no evil. The only reason you lock your doors, guys, is because you fear something. Or you're stupid if you don't lock your doors. But see, in heaven, you won't lock your doors. You won't even have locks because there's no fear. There's no danger. There's no evil. And then this whole idea that he says the kings of the earth will bring their glory into the city. They'll bring into the glory and the honor of the nations. What's going on here? What does this mean? And this is probably the most important thing as we wrap it up. Isaiah says, your gates shall be open continually, speaking of the new Jerusalem. The wealth of the nations will bring, be brought into it. What does that mean? These I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. It's this picture of the end times. It's a picture of this, this time on earth when we will all be redeemed and we will all, from all the nations of the world, will come to this place called the New Jerusalem and we will offer sacrifice, not burnt offerings because there's no temple and there's no sin. But it's really the offering of self. Nations, people, Gentiles is what that word means, are going to replace their glory with God's. They're going to honor God. Everyone will honor God. Can you imagine that? A time when everybody will honor God. No false gods, no false places of worship, no Buddhism, no Mohammedism, all worshiping God. And nobody's praying to a God who doesn't exist. Every nation on the earth will come to Jerusalem to worship God. No more sacrifices of animals. And here's what jumps out at me. We will all be offering sacrifices to God. Well, what is that? And this is your takeaway for the morning. Micah says, what can we bring to the Lord? What kind of offering should we give him? Should we bow before God with offerings of yearling calves? Should we offer him thousands of rams and 10,000 rivers of olive oil? Should we sacrifice our firstborn children to pay for our sins? See this list, it's almost ludicrous. What do I need to bring to God to get him to love me? How do I honor God? And he says, no, no, no. Oh, people, the Lord has told you what is good, and this is what he requires of you, to do what is right, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. That is heaven. You want to know what you're going to do in heaven? You're not going to play a harp. You may, but I don't think so. But you're going to do what is right, you're going to love mercy, and you're going to walk humbly with your God forever. Perfectly, uninterrupted. So here's your first question. I want you to discuss some practical ways in which you can do what is right, love mercy, and walk humbly with God today. Today. 
when you walk out of this room. Because see, if that's his expectation, if that's heaven, shouldn't we be living that way now? Yes, imperfectly. But what does that look like? I want you to go back and look at the incredible descriptions of the new Jerusalem that we blew right past. What do they tell us about God? What do they say about the God who made the new Jerusalem, not the new Jerusalem itself? What do they tell you about God? And then finally, in his Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. What are some practical ways we can increase our thirst for a life of righteousness this side of heaven? What does that look like? How can you become more thirsty for righteousness now? Because you're going to have no thirst for it in heaven. It'll be completely slacked. But see, here, it's not. How do we do that? What does it look like? Father, thank you for these men. Thank you for their patience. Thank you for their willingness to come on spring break and study your word. And I pray, Father, that they would be able, as they talk around the tables, to apply what they've heard to their everyday life. We're talking about future things, Father. We're talking about things that are to come, but we're right now living right here. How do we make a difference now, knowing that we worship the same God and we have the same power that will give us resurrected bodies one day living within us? And I pray this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.